just waiting to be ah see i'm allowed in hi there there you are we need hawk we need 120 of these for a syndication package yeah uh yeah so dig dig into your rolodex your fourth grade teacher is fine yeah hey that's a true story i went to a wedding and the woman said is emily caught your uh your daughter i said yeah she said i was her third grade teacher (laughs) (laughs) true story any anyway, rate, uh, thanks for the intro, Freda, and uh, I am thrilled to be able to speak today with Tony Bill. Tony is only an actor, an Oscar-winning producer, a director, an author, a sailor, a pilot, and a restaurateur, and the father of four daughters. And besides all that, his reputation as a warm and generous mensch is the best part of this amazing human being. So, Tony, come on in. Welcome, and can't wait to get going. And there he is. Here I am. It worked. It worked. Unbelievable. Good morning, and uh, hopefully it's cooler in... uh, Venice than it is in Calabasas, because I I hate to tell you it's perfectly comfortable here. There you go. (laughs) And I just want to remind Tony and everybody that I'm so thrilled because this basically is for the residents of the home who don't get to get out as much as we'd like them to. Mr. Beecher, do you want to say something? No, just welcoming Tony. Tell him how much I appreciate. We all appreciate him doing this and uh, Paul, once again, much gratitude to you for this wonderful show, 36th show in your, in your series. Right. Is, is the check in the mail yet? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, let's get going. I appreciate something. It is such an honor to be invited to. It's, it's really great. Thank you. Um, I guess when one has lived a life like you have, I, I, I don't know where to start, so I got to start at the beginning. You grew up in San Diego, <clears throat> in San Diego, but I understand you weren't a movie fan. San Diego is a beautiful place to sail. Were you, did you read as a kid? Were you a sailor? Were you a pilot? What, yeah. what was going on in your life as a kid? Well, I, I would say movies played a very distant uh, part in my interests. Um, I, my father, I don't even know if my father ever went to a movie. Probably, I think my earliest memory is something like uh, uh, Pinocchio or, uh, you know, some of those children's animated films of the period. Um, but my mother was, my mother was uh, adventuresome. You know, she was a, a woman who never went to college. She was kind of an autodidact. She taught herself what she knew and appreciated with the arts and she had good taste. So while while I wasn't dragged to them, uh, I did get some exposure to some foreign films, I think, uh, the early early influx of those films. Like Bicycle Thief? Yeah, maybe not quite that sophisticated, Uh but but in my my early memories of, of growing up were of sailing, which was, you know, San Diego was a hotbed of sailing, and my father was a dedicated sailor. Uh, so that was the one world that I, I felt I was I belonged in and I was comfortable in. So that was that was that was a place you could really be with your dad. That's correct. And um and also one day in when I was about 12, uh, we went to the road races, the the sports car road races, which were held at Torrey Pines, which is at the time a deserted army base. And in the background of these uh, races was, uh, were some gliders that that are still based in at Torrey Pines glider fort, one of the oldest in the world in the country. And I saw these gliders in the background and I said, that really, that would really be fun. 
And my father said, well, why don't you take, why don't you do it? So um, you only have to be 14 to solo a glider, 16 to solo a powered flight. Wow. And so I became this kind of uh, archetypical kid who, who gets adopted by the glider pilots in order to get things cleaned up. <laughs> so it would be, hey, kid, go bring that line over here. Or, hey, kid, wipe off my windscreen. Or, hey, kid, you know, give me a glass of water. So I was the kind of the runner for the, the, the glider club. But in return for that, I got some lessons. And um, I really got hooked on, on soaring. And so the two things that I did were both machines without, without the engines, sailboats and gliders. And that's, that was, that was, those are my passions. And still, and still are? Well, to a certain extent, yeah. I, um, I've done kind of nothing but sailing and flying in terms of sports all my life. Um, but um, a while back, I lost my plane because a guy landed at Santa Monica and crashed into my hangar oh. and burned up the hangar and the airplane and everything in it. And I thought, well, this is this this is about time I stop. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now, were you in school? I mean, aside from that, I'm sure you were very good in shop because you knew how to. We didn't have shop. <laughs> Oh, because you knew how to tie a knot and yeah. how to pull a... <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good sailor and a pretty good pilot, I would say. Well, I was fortunate enough, I don't even remember when, to you took me out on the Sirius 2 probably 40 years ago. I don't know when, but... Olinka, yeah. O Olinka, yeah. It was, wow, what a, a day. Boat. Yeah, it was a beautiful boat. Yeah. Um, but did, were you a reader also in school? Did you love English or? Very much, very much. My, matter of fact, that's, that's the only thing I did in school, I think, because I don't know how I got out of high school and into college with no other skills. But um, I did. I was a real reader. And, and in college, I was an English major. My, my uh, senior thesis was a book of poetry, the first creative thesis the university had ever done. And yeah, I... I was a reader to a fault, if that's uh, so. It was, and was it everything? Was it the classics and nonfiction and fiction? Yes, everything. More, more fiction. I, I really have become more uh, interested in nonfiction than I used to be. I, uh -huh. I'm more of a a reader of of nonfiction than I than I was before. But everything up until up until I kind of finally got got in control of myself. Uh, a few years ago, I subscribed to a hundred magazines. Oh my God. I didn't realize it until one day I said, I wonder how many magazines I'm getting. And I started saying, well, there's, some come out every week, some come out every month, some come out every two months or six months. But when I added them all up, I, I, I had a hundred uh, subscriptions. Oh my God. Now, because of the internet today, do you still go online and read a lot of those magazines? I do, but I, I, I do and I don't. I go on online to read articles, but I print them out. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't like reading online. It's so interesting because with something with my eyes, I can't read a book anymore. I have to read it on Kindle. It's it. Yeah, I have tried that. I, I didn't quite get deep enough. Yeah. Huh. Well, so why Notre Dame? Were you would. Was Notre Dame the only place? Did you apply to other places? I don't remember, but I, I may not have because my father went to Notre Dame. Ah, legacy. And I I wasn't real interested in going to college, but it was kind of the obvious thing to do, uh, and so kind of to placate him, I guess I applied. For lack of anything else to do, I applied. For lack of any place else to uh, pick out, I applied. And my application was accepted. And, uh, and, and so you go to Notre Dame, and then right from Notre Dame, you come to L.A.? For what reason? Uh, well, when I was at Notre Dame, uh, as you might imagine, at a Catholic men's college in South Bend, Indiana, in the middle of winter, there's not a lot to do. <laughs> so I went to a play. 
and I hadn't, I was not a theater goer per se, but I went to a play at the, at the university playhouse. And um, it was a play called The Boyfriend. Uh, and it's kind of a campy 20s flapper musical. And it looked like so much fun. I said to myself, I think that looks like something that would be fun to do at night, you know, get be in a play. So um, I tried out for the next play. It was Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot, kind of a heady thing. And um, I didn't get any part, but they called me up, called me back, and they said, you know, there's nothing in the play for you and you don't have any experience, but uh, we'd like to, we'd like you to join the theater company and um, kind of um, get to know the ropes, get, get to know backstage and get, get imbued with this, the, 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 the world of the theater. And I said to myself, if not to them, I'm not interested in backstage. I want to be up there. This is not, I, I'm, I'm not joining because I love the theater. I'm joining because it looked like fun to sing and dance. So I went across the street, the, 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 the almost literal, literally, I went across the highway to the women's college, which was an adjunct to Notre Dame called St. Mary's. And they had a fabulous theater department, really fine, first class, big time. And I tried out for a play and I got the part. And they said, try out for our next one. And I did, and I got that. So I never went back to Notre Dame theater. I just stayed as a kind of a permanent fixture at the St. Mary's theater. And for the next three years, um, did a lot of plays, even a musical. And, and you, I'm assuming you, you sang, you danced and you learned. Sort of, I didn't think I had learned anything, but when it came time to graduate, um, the dean of my college, who had this sort of uh, actually personal but also professional investment in me, because I was one of several students who were um, uh, experimental. There were three experimental students in, in, in the university that decided what would happen to these guys if we gave them total freedom to design their own education, which I did. And so I said to him, he said, what's, what are you going to do when you get out of here? You know, when I was graduating, I said, well, I don't know. I said, um, I know there are a lot of things that interest me, but I think it might be kind of interesting to make a living acting. And of course, that, that very expression shows you how little I knew about what professional acting would be. But being from San Diego and having a grandmother in Los Angeles um, seemed like kind of a reasonable proximity. And then uh, he wrote a letter to Leo McCary. Leo McCary being of course. what many of us will know as a, a, a famous uh, director of early talking films. And um, McCary wrote back and he said, if Tony ever comes to LA, you know, have him look me up. So I thought, well, I'm just down the road. I think I'll do that. So I came to LA, looked him up at his office at the Fox lot, which was at the time, uh, a, a wasteland because they shut down Fox for the production of um, Cleopatra. Cleopatra, right? But he was very nice, and he said, um, "Tell me what you've done." And I, I told him, and he said, "You got any pictures?" I said, "No." So he said, "Oh, just a minute." He picks up the phone, and he calls what turns out to be the studio photographer on the lot had his own little studio. We had those in those days. Right? Yeah. And of course, he had nothing to do those days. So he said, okay, come on over. And he took some pictures. And then he says, you got, you, you need an agent. You know any agents? I said, no. He says, just a minute. And he picks up the phone and he calls some guy named Abe. He says, Abe, I got, <laughs> I got this kid here in my office. He's just out of Notre Dame. And I, you know, maybe thought maybe you could uh, meet with him. He said, oh, oh okay. He says, okay, just a minute. Turns out Abe wasn't available, but some other guy in his office was. And he said, okay, be over here on Thursday morning, eight o'clock. So turns out to be, you know, that was Abe Lastfogel at the William Morris Agency. I didn't know. And um, so uh, on the, at the appointed hour on the next Thursday, I go to my grandmother's for a day or night or so, and then go to the, go to the agency. Um, and... Um, I go to a room which is kind of full of agents 
who uh, every Thursday at 10 o'clock or whatever met any of the actors that they wanted the other agents to meet. So the guy in the back of the room says, uh, hey, um, my name's Steve Yates. I'm on the third floor. Come and see me after the meeting. So I go to see Steve Yates, who was a young, hustling junior agent. Um, and I, parenthetically, I might say the first Jew I ever met. Really? I believe so. Wow. Because I had grown up in this Catholic cocoon of high, grammar school, high school, and college, and um, San Diego. And so here I am in this room with this guy who's like kind of like kind of like a, almost a, a, a archetype of the hustling Sammy Glick character that gets. But Schoenberg, yeah. Right? He calls me boy chick. He calls me, he pinches my cheek. He does these things. And I'm like, wow, I, this is new to me. And he calls some guy, um, I think some guy named Howie. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> Howie is some guy at the other end of the phone. He says, Howie, I got this kid in my office. He's just out of Notre Dame. I think he's going to be like another Rock Hudson. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. Oh, no, 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 no. This can't be true. I, I, he says, yeah, I'll, I'll be right over. And so he gets and puts me in his uh, Corvair. And we drive to Paramount. And we drive onto the lot. And we meet this guy, Howie, who was just about the nicest guy I'd met that at that point in my life. The second Jew. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't know. I'm only looking back on this. I, he was just another guy to me. And so was Steve Ace. I, I didn't I didn't have a, a definition or, you know, a, a, an objective definition of who was a Jew and who wasn't. But I now I realize these were the first Jewish men I ever met. I'm sure. So. So you meet Howie. I meet Howie. And what a he's so nice. So nice. You know, I'm sure I'm not the only one who will never forget his kind of odd handshake. He withheld his hand a little bit. He had a little bit of a misshapen yes. finger. As, as a kid, as a kid on a broken milk bottle, he cut this tendon and they didn't know how to fix it. Right. So he always he couldn't open his hand more than like what I'm doing right now. That's right. It was like, kind of like this. I, I, I'll never forget it. It was so special. And anyway, so I meet him, and he took, introduces himself to me as Howard Koch. And he's going to produce a movie with a couple of guys who are in the next room who have never produced or written or directed a movie before, just like me, named Bud Yorkin and Norman Lear. <laughs> so I don't want to make this too long a story. I meet them. They ask me to read a script for them. I go in the next room, read it, come back. I never auditioned before. And they said, well, that's, we like that. Go take the script home and read it and come back tomorrow. So I did. Came back, read it tomorrow. And they said, you know what? We're going to give you a screen test. Uh, to shorten the story, I got the screen test. Uh, I did it. Thank you very much. We'll let you know. Uh, I go back to San Diego, spend about a week or two waiting. And one day uh, I'm at the San Diego Yacht Club sailing. And uh, the phone, somebody says, you have a telephone call from Los Angeles. I go to the dock and it's Steve Yates. And he said, um, you got the part. So that's, that's the end of the beginning of my career. Wow. And, uh, in between, either before, right after your screen test or once you got the part, I, you had dinner at my parents' house, I and I was that. there. I got to meet you. We met in 1961 or 62, whatever year that was. 62. 62. I had my, my birthday during the pre-production of the movie in August, so I turned 22 right there on 61, 62. Wow. But Zarin, 
for everyone listening, uh, I know the answer, but is there a title reveal here? Oh, come blow your horn. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I was going to ask, so now you're going to play the younger brother of Frank Sinatra. Now, were you a music fan? Was Frank a, a did you or your family listen to Sinatra records? Were you, did you watch Sinatra films up till then? No, I, I'm pretty sure I, I'm, I'm sure I was aware of who Frank Sinatra was in the firmament and, you know, of the pop culture. But I'll tell you, the first day of shooting, uh, I was hanging out on the set waiting for him to show up. He was almost always late. And I'm standing around. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if I'm going to recognize him when he walks in. <laughs> I'm not sure. And a guy walks in, and I think it's him. But I'm afraid to go up to him and say anything. And I'm glad I didn't because it was his double. <laughs> so he, he had a guy who always doubled him. As a matter of fact, he's in the movie several times because Sinatra didn't go to New York for the shooting in New York. And when we were walking around the streets of New York, that's... Frank's double and a really good one too, I might add. I mean, you know, but I was kind of, eh, I'm not sure, is this him or not? <laughs> but he was wow. very, very kind to me, very nice to me, uh, always um, conscious of my newness and my youth and my stupidity. And never, I don't think he ever became impatient with me or short. Yeah. Wow. So, now you learn how to, I guess, learning on the job, how to work in front of a camera. And your next movie is with Steve McQueen and Jackie Gleason. Yes. I mean, talk about icons, Sinatra to McQueen and Gleason. Yeah. Had you watched Steve McQueen movies or Jackie Gleason on The Honeymooners? Or Yeah, well, by that time, I kind of knew who they were, you know, like, <laughs> I was pretty aware. But, um, uh I really liked McQueen. You know, we had a lot in common in a way. We were kind of guys that didn't fit in the movie business. We didn't grow up, you know, that way. We were interested in, in this case, in, in um, cars and airplanes. Uh, and, um, and Gleason was just, to me, just, you know, the, the iconic TV star that he actually was. You know, I, I really knew who he was because I watched him on TV. Right. They hated uh, him. Yeah, no, I, Did you I, know worked, yeah, I, I worked with Jackie, his last movie, actually, yeah. a film called Nothing in Common with Tom Hanks, and, and he, he played Tom's dad. Did you, uh, know the, did you know about the animosity between McQueen and, and Gleason? No, I didn't. Well, that, come below your, I mean, uh, Soldier in the Rain is a story of two guys in the Army who love each other. They are best, best, forever best friends. They will do anything for each other. And for the first few days of shooting, McQueen was always late. He would, he would pull on to the, the, the lot, you know, an hour after shooting was good. He, then he'd go to his dressing room. Then he'd take care of his car. And then, he, then he'd finally show up. I, I didn't care. You know, it didn't bother me. But but uh, Gleason started to notice in rehearsals or lighting or whatever that he was always waiting for McQueen, who was a little bit late today. You know, so he'll be he'll be here in a few minutes. He's, and he got really upset at this. This is all behind my back. I learned about it. So Gleason gets increasingly frustrated and pissed off at McQueen and says to the goes to the A.D., and says, why am I waiting for him? I'll tell you what, Pally, what probably one of his expressions. Tell you what, pal, I'll be in my dressing room. And when Mr. McQueen gets to the set, you call me and I'll be there 30 seconds later. But I'm not waiting on the set or any of this stuff. You, you, just, you let me know when he shows up. So that went on for a couple of days. McQueen then notices that Gleason is on the set only after McQueen gets to the set. So that was that was my sense of how it began. But it, they just 
had no use for each other. Wow. Well, and see. So that shows I, the magic. Yeah, I, I worked a story. I worked, uh, I think, Lee Marvin's last movie. I, I did it. I produced a movie called Gorky Park. Right. And we're in Finland, and it's William cool. Hurt is the star. We just lost Bill this last year. Um, but uh, we do a two shot of, of Marvin and Bill Hurt, and then we're going to do a close up. For, the first close up or over shoulder is going to be on to Marvin. And Bill Hurt goes back to his dressing room, and it's snow on the ground. It's cold. We're in Finland. And we're ready, and he doesn't come. And we're ready, and Bill Hurt still doesn't come. And Lee Marvin says, put a gobo with an X next to the camera, and I'll just do it to the, I don't need the, that, that kid, right? Well, we're on like take two or three, and Bill Hurt comes down and sees this. And oh my God, he was so apologetic. And from then on, he was right there. He didn't want to ever let Lee Marvin down. Interesting difference. Yeah, I did something like that when I was directing uh, a movie, and the actress was always late to the set, and we had a scene with uh, four people sitting around a table. And we were waiting for her, and I said, I turned around, and I said, you know what? We could do this whole scene without her. So we started to shoot it. We just dropped her, dropped her dialogue. <laughs> Smart. She Smart. Smart. She showed up a few minutes late, but she figured out what we, we were able to do. All right. So you're 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 working now. You've worked with Ralph Nelson's a pretty good director, and you've got uh, uh, Blake Edwards wrote the script. I don't know if he was around. It's a William Goldman book, Soldier in the Rain. But then you do some television, you do some other stuff, and I guess Howie and Frank call you again and say, hey, you want to come to Hawaii? <laughs> and you do you do another movie where Frank is going to direct. It's called yep. None But the Brave. Now, how was the fact that Frank never showed, you know, was always late on Come Blow Your Horn? Now he's directing. How different was that, and how, how did that work? Well, it was a pretty casual shoot, I guess. Um, I, I was protected from any of that. I, I was just, you know, I was just the actor in, the, in a few of the scenes. I, I was not a, a big part of the movie. Um, so I um, I just chilled, I guess you'd say. I, I, I was waiting the birth of my son. And Frank Sinatra, in the midst of all this, comes to me and says, hey, uh, how, how's, how's, how's that going with that kid you're expecting? And I said, well, I may not make it back in time because it could be any day now and it's pretty soon. And he, call, and he goes to the first day, he goes, come here. He says, you get this guy out of here in time for his baby. Mm. And sure enough, two or three days, I don't even remember, four days wow. a week before I was scheduled to finish, I was out of there. Wow. Well, that's, that's yeah, the kind of... Back. The kind of guy I saw when my dad ran his company. Right. Um, and now you do Marriage on the Rocks. Uh, <laughs> Classic. <laughs> I, have a, I have a story. I don't know if you were on the set, but I have a story. Uh, a, a friend of mine who actually taught me how to be an AD was named David Salvin. He was the first I AD. Loved him. Loved him. He what a great, great guy. guy. Great guy. And he told me the story of when, because Frank was in the movie, Dean Martin, Deborah Carr, you, I can't remember the other female actress. Uh, but at any rate, Frank said to him, call me in my office when you're ready to shoot. When I come through the door of the stage, roll the camera. I'll go to my mark. And that's exactly what Dave had to do. Frank walked in, walked to his mark. They said, action. He said the lines, he looked at the camera and went, cut, print, and walked back off the stage and back to his office. Because he could. <laughs> wow. I mean, that that's not the movies that I exactly wanted to uh, to do. But did, did you, I don't know, did you become close with my dad? Or, I mean, he was around, I know. You know, uh, your dad was always uh, so paternal and so um, 
so lovely to me. I, I felt like part of his family. I mean, the fact that he brought me home to meet his son when you were in high school right. was the beginning of that kindness and consideration. Right. Well, that's who he was. Um, so a little bit later, you get to you work with a young Francis Coppola on You're a Big Boy Now, and then you work with Sidney Pollack, who I did two movies with, uh, on Castle Keep. Yeah. Tell, tell me, as an actor now, the difference between working with Bud Yorkin, Sidney Pollack, Francis Coppola, process-wise. I mean, I realize, you know, was there... Did you sense, whoa, this person really knows how to talk to an actor? Because Sidney was an actor. Was there a difference? That's a good question. Uh, I, I've asked myself, as people like you, you are, have asked me over the years, what did I learn from working with Hal Ashby or Francis Coppola or Sidney Pollack or Stuart Rosenberg? I mean, I worked with a lot of really wonderful people. And I don't know what I learned. I really don't know what I learned from what person. Uh, hmm. I think what I learned in common from all of those people and so and others was to um, be patient, not push the actors. I, mean, I never worked with one of those kind of directors that you never want to work with, the kind that push you around, tell you, sit here, stand there, say it that way, give you line, you know, the, all the kind of no-nos that, that I think almost all actors uh, abhor in directors, uh, directors that aren't aren't paying attention to them, directors that are telling them how to do it, directors that are flying off, getting pissed off and yelling at the crew, all those people. I, I think I got so lucky that I only worked with directors that you would like to be like in terms of their behavior, in terms of their personality. Um, I, I once worked with a director who cried. He cried in frustration. Oh, I thought it was because you were so bad or so good oh, in a scene. Yeah, probably some of those, but... <laughs> That's the kind of the only one I remember that's like, like, holy cow, this guy is different than all the other directors. But he was he was a lovely guy. Um, he was a television director. And um, but when he got frustrated on the set, guys, you're killing me, guys, you know, that we're running behind schedule. Guys, oh, guys, you're killing me. Come on. <laughs> that's the way he was. And then, oh you know, OK, oh. we're good. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, my so, God. Uh you know, and 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 Hawk, the the reason, if there is one, that I stopped acting and stopped producing, uh, and directed my first film, was that I really didn't feel, after whatever number of years or decades it was, that I had learned anything. I really didn't feel like I had learned anything, and and I and I felt fraudulent showing up for work in any capacity without feeling like I knew what I was doing, and or trusting the fact that I didn't know what I was doing, and um, so I thought, you know, I maybe I shouldn't stay in the movie business. Maybe I, there's something else out there that I would be better at that I would feel I knew what I was doing. So I thought. I guess the only thing I know to prove to myself, if not to others, that, I, that I'm doing something that I am handling well, is to take a test. And the test for that is directing a movie. If you direct a movie and it turns out well, you did a good job. And there's no argument. It's like getting your paper graded. There's only a certain, <laughs> there's a pass fail and there's a hundred and, so I thought directing a movie would be the test that I would trust to let me go on in the film business and feel like I did something that I knew what I was doing, even if I didn't think I did or feel like I did. You know, I just so that was um, 
That was really a short film uh, of O. Henry's short story, uh, The Ransom of Red Sheep. Ransom of Red Sheep, right. You know, it was a short film, but it turned out quite well. And then my feature, My Bodyguard, turned out quite well. And that was my turning point for saying, should I even stay in the movie business? Wow, I, never, I didn't know I that. Anybody. I never said that, but that's... Well, but that, it's, it's interesting how deep someone who kind of naively walked in, hey, I think I'll try and be an actor, to someone who really thought through, you know, your life at that point in your life. But going back, even in the 60s, you were someone who wasn't just acting. You were looking, you were you were questioning stuff like, like I, I know um, you read The Graduate and tell that story. Because by the way, I think Larry Terman is listening because he's out at the home with us. I'm hoping Larry's there. I want to say hello to him at the very beginning here. Yeah. I want to come visit him. Please. Um, you know, just being out of college, being overeducated, being, you know, interested in too many things at once. Um, uh, I found myself in a business that I knew nothing about. And I wondered why nobody that I knew in the movie business had the interests that I had in terms of writing, painting, music, uh, philosophy, and fiction. And why wasn't anybody making a movie about the generic me, the young guy, just out of college, well-educated, not a surfer, you know, not a druggie, just a, a guy, you know, somebody, a, a generic person of whom there were thousands. Why everybody in the movie world who was in a movie was at a beach party or doing something stupid or something, you know, like, and I, I haven't studied this. You could tell me. I don't think there were any, uh, in 1962, when I got into the film business, I don't think there was an, uh, a single honest film about a young person. They were all contrived. They were Beach all- Beach blanket bingo. Like a bingo, or uh, I don't even know, some imaginary right. world. Yeah. And so I started asking my friends, like Mr. Koch and Mr. Yorkin and Mr. Lear. What, well, gee, what, you, has anybody ever thought of, making the movie about this or did you ever read this book or huh? and that that grew into a series of of suggestions that i that i gave to people happily and saw get done so i gave francis coppola the novel you're a big boy now which was an, an obscure english novel not an american one uh, I brought Liza Minnelli, The Sterile Cuckoo, a, another first novel that wow. was under the radar. Um, and I liked this book called The Graduate. And I told some of my friends about it. And as with those others, uh, except Francis did option You're a Big Boy Now, but right. The Sterile Cuckoo had been optioned by... Uh, Alan, by Alan Pakula and uh, Mulligan, right? Uh, and um, and sure enough, a, a, a very smart guy named Larry Terman had optioned the graduate, but um, but it gave me a little bit of confidence to see other people follow a path that I thought was a smart one, and so um, yeah, and so it, it, Larry was kind enough to con consider me, and so I was one of the people they they tested for the graduate. And um, and I've known Larry Terman happily ever since. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, he gave me my first associate producer credit. Move me up. Um, so now you decide to produce, and you meet a guy because, and I want to know you you go. I guess you go see Bob Evans, and you say I've got this script of this guy Terry Malick. Actually, I went I went first to my pal, my sailing pal, John Kelly. Ah. Right. He had taken over Warner Brothers, but yes. Right. Yeah. I had a friend named Terry Malick, who was just out of uh, AFI, and who was a real good friend and a, a, a kind of a kindred soul. You know, we both had interests in odd things. You know, country music or philosophy or uh, 
you know, we, we had a real uh, meeting of the minds and of, of uh, educational backgrounds. He was a Harvard graduate, uh, you know, got to know him as a good friend. And, um, and I had an idea for a movie. And I, uh, I thought, there's a world out there that's not in the movies, just like young people are not. And it's the world of country music and big rig truck driving, the world of the people that drive those trucks every day. And there's a whole lexicon of, of music about that. And so Terry and I went to Cali and pitched it and Cali bought the idea. And it, they, then they passed on it at Warner Brothers and it ended up at, Warner, at uh, Paramount. And, well, and I so, made, what I tell my students, I made the two biggest mistakes a producer can make, especially a first time producer. I hired the wrong director and I didn't fire him. Well, what you might not know is that Bob Evans called me and said, I want you to go to Tennessee. We've got this problem on this movie and I want you to be my e eyes and ears and tell me what the hell's going on. And I spent about a week there and I said to Evans, you got to get rid of this guy. <laughs> It I did was too. I it, did too, but they said, well, we can't do that. It's too late. And Evan said, come home. We're not going to do it. Leave it alone. Yeah. And I remember Alan Arkin looking at me and saying, what's Paramount going to do? <laughs> Alan Arkin was the star a lot. Yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, any rate, so I, I had a connection with that with you. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting there suffering and, and, you know, you know, when you're, especially when you're a first time producer, you just can't fire somebody because you want to fire them. You have to get the permission of all the people that sent you there. And they, they kind of, you know, we don't know what, and what I really wanted to do was hire my friend, Terry Malick to take over. But of course, replacing one first time director with another first time director was not exactly a right. solution. Right. Um, wait a minute. Okay. I, now I'm just, I'm so interested in everything you're saying, Tony. It's really amazing. So <laughs> after Deadhead Miles, how did you meet uh, Michael and Julia? Michael and Julia Phillips. Um, you, the next thing you did, I think, was Steel Yard Blues. That's right. You remember things better than I do, Pa. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, Alan Meyerson's been a friend of mine since I did Bill, Billy Jack. The committee, Alan Meyerson, had a, uh, had a bit in that. Yeah. Well, um, the next thing that happened was, you know, I, I, I have, I had then as now, I was almost exclusively interested in first time people. I've, ne I've never felt comfortable around big stars or big names or big executives or big whatevers. And I've always felt very comfortable with new people, whether it's a writer or director, producer, or actor. And so uh, I, I, I was reading scripts and I read a first time writer's script uh, of, of a young man who had just graduated from UCLA. And um, I thought it was really talented, just uh, quirky, weird, offbeat, not what people wanted in our business. They didn't want that. They wanted something was just like everything else. But this was an unusual script. And I asked to meet him and his name was David Ward. And I said, you know, I, I don't, this is a pretty weird script. It's, it's not weird, but it's very, very offbeat. It's called Steel Yard Blues. And I said, but what do you want to do after this? What, what's, do you want to write something, have something else you want to do? He said, yeah, I got this idea about a couple of guys in the 20s, a couple of con men. One of them is a kid who, whose best friend gets murdered by a big time guy. And he decides he's just going to go after the guy and take him for every dollar he's got. That was, that was almost a quote. Wow. And I said, I love that idea. I'm going to set about to, to get it done, made, get you to write it. And so I ended up meeting Julia Phillips in New York at, at uh, a company, uh, First Artists, which she had been involved with. And because I wanted, I don't know why. Anyway, they, they took me under their wing there, she and Stevie Phillips. And then I got to be friendly with Julia and her husband, Michael, who was not in the movie business, but wanted to be. And um, 
I said, why don't we, why don't we pool our resources and option Steelyard Blues and commission the Sting? And that's that's the answer to your question. Wow. That's how it all started. Okay. So we how did we didn't have any money? You know, five thousand bucks between us got that done. Wow. It just us, I that, love that. I absolutely love that story. It was because I keep I keep saying to my grandsons and everything, I said, look, learn how to tell a story and read as much as you can. Yeah, you can go to film school, but take English classes and learn about story. And I, you're absolutely, you heard a story and you went, yeah. So, so now you, I guess, do you get, you shoot Steel Yard and you, you're working with, I guess she was a pretty big star by then, Jane Fonda. Yeah. She was the uh, girl that wagged the dog, actually. Right. Yeah. And, and tell me about, did Ward write the screenplay before you went to Zanuck Brown, or how did Zanuck yeah, Brown get? We had the script in hand. David finished the script after actually actually after working, taking a little time off to work for Larry Terman. He did a, a, a project in the middle of all this. Sure, go ahead. We happy happy you're doing that. Um, so uh, about a year later, he delivered the script of the Sting to us. And um, we read it and we said, we love it. And what are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to go to a couple of people in the business with the script. And um, John Kelly was the first one. But he thought it was a shaggy dog story, to quote him. God bless you, John. He passed. Uh, a couple other people liked it. And we thought, well, we haven't gone to Universal with it. And Zanuck and Brown were executives at Warner Brothers. They weren't producers of anything at the time. They were movie executives. But they were very nice to us at Warner Brothers. And they went to Universal to become a kind of producing and part of the company. So we thought, you know, instead of taking it to Universal, let's give it to Zanuck and Brown as a gift, as a thank you for being nice to us as young producers at Warner Brothers on Steel Yard Blues. So that's how they got their names on the movie. And you didn't have, you, did you, you didn't have Paul or Redford at that point, did you? No. <laughs> and we, we both, both Julia and I knew Redford. But, um, and we gave him the script. But uh, th th that's, that's how Zanuck and Brown. Made. Wow. Now, this movie comes together with a pretty good director. George Roy Hill, and are you on the set? Are you watching dailies at, back at the studio? How, how, how is it during shooting? During shooting, since there was Julia, Michael, and me, and a, uh, um, a very, um, what's the word? Very dogmatic George Roy Hill. You know, here's how I do it. Here's where they, here. So we decided that instead of all three of us swarming around him and giving us and he, he didn't he didn't need our opinion he, right as producers so michael phillips was our point person with george roy hill who had never been on an, only steel yard was the first time he was in the yeah. business yeah but michael's a, a great producer a great person and a great producer and a yeah. great mediator uh and he was the perfect perfect person then and we would he would be the perfect person now okay the movies Talk about the, the first, where was the first preview and how'd it go? There was only one preview. It was down in uh, like Long Beach. Um, I, I went, uh, I can remember vividly that it seemed to go quite well. Um, and I, I, what I remember most is walking out of it with my good friend, Don Devlin, who was a producing pal of mine. And, he, and we walked out and we were walking to the parking lot and we, we had the usual, what do you think? Well, I don't know, what do you think? Well, I, you know, I think, and he, he said, well, wh how do you think it's gonna do? And I said, I think if we're really lucky, it'll do close to Butch Cassidy business, which was an easy comparison. And I was wrong by uh, about 100%. It did about twice what Butch Cassidy did. 
you can't, as you know, you you just can't tell. Even if you walk out of a preview that goes well, you don't know. All right, so now you get nominated for an Oscar. Young producers nominated for an Oscar. You're sitting there, and I happened to go to YouTube this morning because I wanted to see you and Julia and Michael winning the Oscar. And you want to talk about who was presenting the Oscar and what was it like before and after your names, your movie was mentioned as winner of best picture. Well, I hate to seem jaded or naive or both, but we had sat there in that theater for whatever it is, like three hours before the best picture nomination. And six times before that moment, somebody from the Sting won an Academy Award for music, for writing, for the, and you know, but I have to say, by the time that came around, it was not a jump out of your seat surprise that it got best picture. It was kind of anticlimactic because it was obvious. And so I I didn't fake it. I just got up and went up and got it from Elizabeth Taylor. I really didn't say anything because my partner, Julia Phillips, who was never at a loss for words and quite bright and eloquent, took over. Michael, who's the shyest guy around, especially at the time, he you know acceded to, to that. And we just kind of stood there like the rubes we were with all the stage people saying, get, get off, get off, get off, you know, you know, because they're running over over time. So they're all encouraging at least me to shut up. Well, I just did. <laughs> hey, hey, Hulk and Tony, before we leave the sting, I just wanted to make one more uh, MPTF connection because uh, Hal Gould, who had multiple roles in that movie, was a resident here for a number of years. Uh, and then his wife, Lee, uh, was here for a number of years after that as well. He wow. Steals, he stole the movie as an actor. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. He yeah. was great. Um, you keep... Uh, you talk about the directing. Uh, there's a question that... Uh, our director, Jen Clymer, asked that I want to read because we're about My Bodyguard time. My Bodyguard is one of the greatest films from the 1980s and in the world of cinema stands the test of time. And she's right because I watched it again about a week ago. Do you think the same story could be told in today's climate with the cyberbullying, gun violence epidemic, or would it have to be modified in any way to capture the same realism it had in 1980. Oh, that is from Jeff from our crew. That's who asked the question. That's a great question. So, uh, every now and then, somebody brings up to me the notion of, of a remake or an update of My Bodyguard. And it's, it's kind of laughable to me that anybody could imagine that, that being scared to death of somebody these days would not include real physical violence. But the real fear we have, and which is in that story, is the fear of humiliation by someone else. The fear of someone making us feel bad about ourselves and making us feel un impotent and not powerful and not able to talk back and not able to come up with a good one-liner. So I think at that level, I think it would work. I don't think, and I don't, I don't really think the movie itself needed physical violence. In fact, uh, the only thing that happens in the movie is somebody gets punched in the nose. And, um, and even that, even that was a directorial error on my part, not realizing that you could stage a, a fight in the middle of a park. I, ne I had not realized fights need boundaries. The, you, a fight in the middle of a park is like, has no, has no boundaries. And we got out there and I thought, holy cow, there's nothing here to stop a guy from running away or, or falling out of the 
you know, the, 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 the combat. So I think, I think that you could do it today. I think it would be a different form of intimidation. I think it would not even remotely, it would be, it would seem tame that someone's afraid of getting beat up by somebody, but yeah. it certainly wouldn't, it certainly wouldn't seem unusual because it happens all the time now. All right. So now we've talked about flying. We've talked about sailing, acting, producing, directing. We haven't talked about yet is the fact that you become a restaurateur and I used to go to 72 Market Street all the time. And then when you open Maple Drive, I would, not that you know this, but Maple Drive is very important to me because that's where I decided to get bar mitzvahed and change my name for my 50th birthday. So talk about being a restaurateur and why. Well, I really like to eat at interesting restaurants, not famous ones, Per se, or expensive ones, but I like I like interesting food. And um, when when I decided to move my my professional life to Venice, Francis Coppola had invited me to come with him to San Francisco. You know, I'm going to San Francisco. I'm going to have this, and he had this grand and indeed accurate vision of how he was going to have his own company in San Francisco. But I I wasn't ready to do that. So I did the same kind of thing in Venice. I, I bought a building in Venice and, 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 and used it as my headquarters and the headquarters for a lot of other people who rented an office there. Uh, and so that was fine. And, but there was, Venice was a, 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 a wasteland in terms of restaurants. There was only one restaurant worth going to uh, and almost no others. So I had done a couple of movies with Dudley Moore, and he lived in Venice. And as you know, Dudley was a world-class pianist, but he had no place to play. Well, I said one day, the building across the street from me is for sale. It's an art gallery. I said, Dudley, how about I buy this gallery? Because it was very inexpensive, empty. How about I buy this gallery? We'll raise some money, and we'll open a restaurant, and you'll have a place to play the piano, and I'll have a place to eat. He said, oh, great, Tony. And that's what happened. So we opened a restaurant. And I think the success of that restaurant is not that I know the restaurant business, which, of course, I didn't. I've never done it. But I think it's the same as the success of a movie. And I don't mean the financial success. Of something, but I think when a movie turns out really well, it's because everything in it is pretty right. The script was pretty right. The cinematography was great. The music, the background, the costumes, all the little things. There's all these little things. They all don't ma matter that much, but they all add up. And you see this movie and you say, that was a really good movie. And I think the case is the same with restaurants. That's the only lesson I've learned. Wow. And so we, we kind of did everything right. And it was a huge success for almost 20 years until Dudley got very ill and died and other re many other restaurants opened and our chef went to open another place. And so I, I like the movie business, Hawk, I'm not sure I know anything about the restaurant business, ex except in the sense I know what I like and I know what I don't like. And I kind of sometimes they all add up. So we closed 72 and then a few months ago, or a year ago, a couple of young guys who had never so much as waited a table in their lives. They never had a restaurant. They had no experience at all, kind of the way I like to work with people. They had no experience. They came to me and they said, we'd like to lease your restaurant, your, your space. And um, we don't have much money, but we have ideas and taste. I said, OK. And they opened in uh, February, and they are killing it. It is probably the most success, most busy restaurant on the west side of L.A. They're really? doing a great job. Living yeah. in Ojai, I haven't been there. What's the name of it? They, they, very, they pay homage to it. They call it Market Venice. Ah, wow. I'll have to go one next time I come in L.A. All you got to do is call me.
you and I will have dinner or lunch or something. Be great. Yeah. So I know you've talked about these things, but is, have you thought about, is there a director that inspired you more than any others? Good question. I would, I think Truffaut, I think his sensibility, not, I haven't seen all of his movies, but I think his early films were a, an influence on me. You and Robert Benton. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Benton, Benton says the same thing. <laughs> but he, Benton probably because he saw a lot of movies and chose it. Me, because he, that was one of the few directors that I knew who they were. Uh, because my mother took me to see a couple of movies. Right. Wow. Is there, same question, actor? Is there an actor inspired you? Well, I... <laughs> Roy Rogers was the first actor that I thought, <laughs> as a kid, was really cool. <laughs> the earliest actor I can remember just going to the Saturday afternoon matinees to see Roy Rogers. Isn't that funny? Yes. And is there a, is, what about a producer? Callie, maybe? No? Callie really wasn't a producer. He was a studio executive. Yeah, well, a, I, I met him as a producer, but he he, he was he, he was always avoiding being the producer. Yes. Uh, well, you know, your dad is the first producer I ever met, and I haven't met a more a lovelier, more generous person since. To tell you the truth, yeah, he kind of taught me how to behave. Yeah. I mean, I've I've he did seen, a good job. Oh, I've seen other producers who I would not like to emulate but uh, very few that I'd be proud to be compared to. Okay, so you've done all these things. Now you decide to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> and I love this book. Talk, talk about it, this book, because I think well, if it's not at the motion picture home, uh, Beecher and Jen, we've got to get it there. It's called Movie Speak. Go ahead. Well, about a dozen years ago now, my wife, Helen Bartlett, who's a wonderful producer, and I were doing some something together, and she asked me, uh, we were on the set, and somebody yelled out, bring this or do that, and she said, what, is that? what does that mean? And I said, you know, I'm not, sh I'm not sure. Let me, let me find out exactly where that comes from. So I, 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 I realized, I went, to, I went to look up where I could look up movie terms, all the terms that we all have grown up with and used. And, and parenthetically, by the way, on the set of Come Blow Your Horn, I was exposed for the first time in my life to the language of movies. And I spent a lot of time on that movie with crew members being nice enough to me to say, don't, don't ever stand there, you know, make sure your eye line, whatever. So I learned the manners of the set and I learned the terms that whenever I asked somebody, you know, what does that mean? What is it? Oh, what's he asking? What's he? Doing? So it was a very, it was my oldest fascination in the movie business was the language that we all have learned to use. So I went to kind of look it up and I discovered no one has ever written it down. I couldn't believe it that no one in the history of the movies had done a lexicon, a dictionary, a kind of a cheat sheet. I of, missed something. Of those movies. Can you say so, it again? So, something speaking to me. So, I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna start looking it up. I don't know where. So every time I worked for the next eight or ten years, I on the set, I would ask people, "Hey, what? Tell, what did you just say? Why? Where do you think that comes from? Or where, what's your understanding?" What, or how do you use that? When do you say that? So I, I did it on sets. For will you, will you tell? Will you tell the story of? Because I always thought MOS meant mid out sound. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we all do, right? So yeah, MOS was a perfect example because it's so ubiquitous. Whether almost anybody in the movie business says, "Of course, I know what it means." And, I, and they say, I'm not sure where it comes from. It either comes from Eric von Stroheim or a couple of German directors. But I dug a little deeper. And again, I looked in books that you would not look for this answer in. 
uh, but I found what I believe is the answer to MOS. MOS, every, as you say, everybody in the film business knows that it means mid-out sound. And the only uh, disparity is like, where did it, where was that first uttered? You know, which director? But I looked into it and here's, here's my strong advice. In the early days of sound, the sound stripe on the piece of film stock was uh, married in the lab to the picture. And at the end of the day, the, uh, the material that had been shot during the day, the, the picture and the sound was sent to the same lab. And uh, if the sound material was not recorded or was, hadn't been recorded, the box of sound that was sent to the lab was annotated that it is missing the optical stripe. MOS, missing MOS. optical stripe, wow. And I stand by that. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. Wait a minute. Jen, Freda Johnson, what's your question, Freda? Um, hi. Wait, let me just do that. Um, I have was... some some history in our town too. Her her father in law was Nunnally Johnson. Pretty pretty good screenwriter. <laughs> Which has nothing to do with my question. Um, I loved seventy two Market Street. I thought it was design wise visionary. Um, in its minimalism, I think it opened a new trend of that kind of dining. But what I loved mostly about it was the lectures, the people that would come in and, and talk. Can, how did that begin? Why did you do that? It was um, extraordinary. Well, um, thank you for commenting on the design. Uh, in keeping with my uh, unwritten rule of working with new people, the designers of that restaurant were uh, Michael Rotundi and uh, Tom Main. Tom Main was just out of film, uh, just out of architect school when I hired him to do the design. And he has subsequently won the Pritzker Award, which is the highest award in the world for architecture. So I'm proud of those guys. Um, the lecture series came, I'm pretty sure, because my wife, Helen, who was a contributing editor to the Paris Review, uh, which is a major literary magazine quarterly. And I thought, why don't well, the restaurant sitting, sitting there on a Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon, why don't we have a, uh, somebody come and talk? Mm -hmm. So it started with, it started with a kind of literary bent. Uh, we had George Plimpton, who was the editor of the Paris Review. We, we had, uh, 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 Ray Bradbury was a friend of mine, and we had other literary people. But then we started saying, well, how, uh, how about other interests? Like Helen was very in, uh, was a dance major in college, so we invited one of the Twyla Tharp. So we had our own interests that we chose to share with the rest of the neighborhood, so to speak. So it could have been, it was, you know, John Hammond Jr., one of the great blues uh, singers. We, we had a friend of mine who was a, 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 a unmanned space vehicle pilot in those days at JPL, came and talked about the space program from the point of view of, of, of a guy that actually flies the spacecraft. So anyway, our eclectic and various interests were on display for all of our friends to come and enjoy on a on a Saturday, and I'm glad you liked it. Uh, uh, I've leased my studio for the next 20 years to a company called Noya House, which is a kind of a Soho house and workspace, and I'm really trying to encourage them to follow up on that tradition on that street. Yeah, we'll that see. would be good. It really brought a lot of people together. Thank I, you. I remember Bill Irwin. Great. Was there once Ricky J. Rick, another friend of mine. Yeah, we it's, just lost Ricky two years ago now. Yeah. So yeah. it was basically it was like come meet my friends. You know, come meet <laughs> Helen's and my friends. 
Right. Wow. Well, thanks for that. And thank you for coming today. So what's next, Tony? Are you writing another book? Are you Are directing another movie? What are you doing next? Uh, I don't know if I've got a book in me because uh, uh, I don't know if I have the energy to do some of the things that I think would make fun reading. If I do, I'll have to call you because you'll be able to tell me more stories than I know. One of, one of the books that I think would be a great book is a book about the, the roles in movies, whether it's a, a director or a star, that, that didn't happen. So the first, it's kind of a book about the danger of first choices. Like, thank God, yeah. thank God that that actor didn't get the part that he was offered or that director, thank God that director turned down that movie because look who did it. Ah, well, it turned down because I have one on Peggy Sue Got Married. I started with Jonathan Demme and Deborah Winger and ended up with Francis Coppola and Kathleen Turner. And there's a whole story about how that happened. Yeah, not necessarily better or worse in some cases. Right. But, but right. surprising, very often surprising. Like, I don't remember who the original cast of... Uh, of uh, the that movie, not the Getaway. Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, when you hear who was gonna do do it or who they wanted, you say, "Are you kidding? That's that's who they wanted." Oh my God! Thank God they didn't get them. <laughs> I tell I tell students now and then about um, the example I use is Midnight Cowboy. Do you remember Michael Sarazen? Oh, very well. Young actor, a, a, a kind of contemporary of mine, good actor, right. lovely guy. Um, John John Schlesinger wanted him for the role of Joe. The John Voigt role. And he was under contra term contract to Universal, and they wanted too much money for him. So John Schlesinger says, "Ah, the hell it! I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pay that kind of money. I'm gonna get an unknown." There you go. There you go. Tony, this has been so much fun. I can I, I, we just we got to do it again or I got to I got to I got to get to Venice. Uh Jen has a question that she always asks our our celebrities here. Uh Tony, thank a thank you. I'm sure all of uh, the residents are applauding right now also. So well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be among them and join them in this way and be able to talk to them. And I hope, it's funny, I've been meaning to get out and see Larry because I told him I would. And there's probably someone else there that I, I, I should. Oh, you won't believe how many. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I haven't been out there in, in a couple of years because of COVID, but hopefully, Bob, when, when do you think we're going to be able to come out there again? Well, you can you can uh, do some like one on one visits. Hawk used to come out and we used to do these lunches with five, six, seven uh, residents. Right. We're not we're not there yet, but uh, I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I got to share with you guys. Larry Terman has his own panel show weekly on Creative Chaos. Um, I don't know. We we show a movie that he has recommended over the weekend, and then on Tuesday, a handful of people get together and talk about what they enjoyed about the movie, what they gained from it, um, and it's a very interesting kind of a, um, you know, the next step in his USC uh, teaching. Well, he's a great teacher. I tried to serve him well for 20 years or so. And I, I really miss it. Yeah. And he, it, me it, too. He, um, I will happily connect you guys. And if there's a moment when, you know, one of your films is some a, a film we show over the weekend, maybe you join sure. us for that panel. Show Five Corners. Great movie. Five Corners. Five Corners. Thank you. Great movie. All right. So. The two really difficult questions we ask all of the people that join us on Creative Chaos, and we've been doing this live interactive show since the pandemic as a way to keep people emotionally and mentally well while they have to stay physically distanced from each other. This is our social connection. Here's what we ask. What is your favorite movie and what is your favorite television series? 
I'm going to be the worst person who ever answered that question. Because <laughs> I, I am not a student of films, nor am I a watcher of television. I will tell you that I watched recently the first time in my life that I've watched, that I've binge watched something, only one show. Uh, I just happened to watch it because people said it was so good. And dope I watched sick. it. Was it dope sick? No. No, I hear it's good, but mm. there's so much I have to watch. I can't, I can't be qualified to have a favorite because I have nothing to compare it to. But I, I could not stop watching Breaking Bad. Mm. Uh, I started watching it and I watched straight through for like five days the whole show. That's the only show I've ever watched in that manner. It's a terrific series. Are, yeah. are you um, considering binging uh, Better Call Saul now? Uh, no, I, I don't think I could in, consider binging anything because I'm not sure I could stick with it. Right. I'm, I don't think my life uh, allows it. I think the COVID, I think COVID allowed me to binge watch that one show, but somehow so much else appeals or comes up or cancels out or, or whatever. And I, I don't think I have a favorite movie because there are so many, the opposite is that there are so many to choose from. Right. Um, Tony, you're, you're stuck on a desert island and you can only take one movie with you <laughs> to watch over and over again. What is it? Well, I, it would be the cliche. It would be The Godfather because that's- There we go. There we such, go. It's such an obvious choice, but there are movies that I can't even remember their titles that, that I think that movie, I could watch that movie over and over again. So I'm glad I don't have to watch a movie over and over again because <laughs> I would be doing something else on the desert island than watching a movie. That's for sure. <laughs> I would be making a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Can, I share, can oh. I share a quick story before we go? Because sure. um, I, I have heard this story from my mom and I don't know if, you had um, people share this with you from an audience reaction. She, uh, I grew up on the East Coast in not a very entertainment-based uh, community. She is a huge Paul Newman and uh, Robert Redford fan. And the only story she's ever shared with me about, you know, an experience in terms of entertainment is going to see The Sting and toward the end, having the entire crowd devastated that yet again, Paul Newman and Robert Redford aren't gonna make it out alive. And the eruption of joy when they really, you know, when you realize it's a blood capsule that they've been, yeah, and yeah. did you hear that from all sorts of audiences? Like that was a universal experience? It really is. It, it's pretty, it was a pretty amazing the first time I, at that screening I went to in Long Beach. It's just, holy, the people just went crazy. And, you know, I never suspected that the audience en masse would have that kind of response. It would be a, a nice little surprise, you know. But, uh, yeah. And Tony, you can, did, did you get a chance to watch this documentary series that's on the la what's it called the last film actors with uh, Newman last and movie, Joanne Woodward? The last movie star. I the did, last movie star, yeah. and I recommend it. It's one of the few things I've seen recently. Uh, it's a six parter. Yeah, um, I, I got the chills. I got to work with Paul and Joanne twice, and uh, boy, yeah, what memories! It's a very it's, uh, you know, I wish I knew, maybe Hawk can help me. I want to write Ethan Hawk a fan letter, the director. Yeah. I thought his imagination and his accomplishment in that doc was extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I wish I knew how to reach him. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll get you that, we'll get you that information. Too. That would be yeah. great. I have a friend that um, works with him pretty frequently, so. All right, Jen, it's on you, Jen. Okay. 
Great. All right, guys. Thank you again. Thanks, Happy Tony. day for everybody. Tony, I can't thank you enough, man. It was magical. I'm, I'm honored to be invited. Thank you. I am. Take care. Thank you, everybody. We're going to show you some promos, and we are back at 1230 with your meditation and urban zen. Tony, you were amazing. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Of course.